Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As was mentioned, the text we'll be meditating on this morning is the gospel lesson you heard from John 1. Having just heard it, let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, open now our hearts and our minds, that we may better come to know and to understand your word. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. <clears throat> My dear fellow recipients of the Lord's call, I think one of the single most effective ways that you can tell someone about something really is word of mouth. And you can know this is true because it's not just me talking about this either. I've heard that studies have shown that the single best form of advertising is word of mouth. People have a tendency to trust not something that they see online or hear from a, a paid salesperson, but if it's someone that they know, a friend or relative giving them good advice, they're more likely to believe it. I think the same thing can also be said that people, even as much as they trust hearing things word of mouth, they also like to see for themselves as well. A picture is indeed worth a thousand words, and sometimes it does take exactly that, seeing something, experiencing it with your own eyes in order to believe it. I still remember this happening very vividly to me and my buddies in college. A dear friend of mine who is a very faithful pastor serving God's people in Ohio, he had a notorious reputation for doing everything last minute. I'm pretty sure in our first year of our time at MLC, not one paper was started unless it was the night before the paper was due. That's just the kind of guy that this guy was. And I remember hearing my friends talk about how at one point this guy had put off his paper so much that he actually slept in the computer lab next to the printer. And he did his work in the computer lab there because it was too comfortable in his own room. He wouldn't have gotten any work accomplished there. So he slept in the computer lab, no blanket, no pillow, just curled up in a corner, slept for about 20 minutes, and then wrote an entire paper in the span of one night. I, of course, didn't believe it until I saw the picture of my friend curled up, using his hands as a pillow, in the computer lab. Some things you only, can only be believed if you see them for yourself, or see some evidence of it. Maybe it was some insane cloud formation, or it was something crazy that uh, you saw in a storm. Maybe it was some animal or a, a buck that you saw or someone else shot that you didn't believe was true. Maybe it was an outrageous deal that you saw at the store. Whatever it may be, a picture is worth a thousand words. In our gospel lesson for today, we have a similar experience where we have a man who is told something so outrageous even trust, hearing it from a trusted friend wasn't enough for him. He had to go and see it for his own eyes. And he did see. Nathaniel saw the truth. He saw his Lord and Savior. He saw the King of Israel. And just like Nathaniel, we too see our King as he reveals himself to us. We are reminded as Philip tells his friend Nathaniel to come and see the greater things of God. Now our text for today is part of a very tight-knit group of stories. If you look at John's Gospel and you look at the paragraph headings, you'll see one phrase repeated over and over again. The next day, the next day, the next day. We, of course, are all very familiar with the account of John pointing to our Savior and says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The next day, we have the call of Andrew and Peter. Men who were disciples, who were faithful men, who were fishers, who were ready to heed Jesus' call. Then the next day, we see another two men called, Philip and Nathaniel. Then the next day, Jesus is going out, and then he's going on to Cana. This is a rapidly moving picture of our Savior as he gets ready to undertake his journey from the river to the mountain. 
And so our Savior is preparing his followers. He's gathering the men he needs that he will want to have with him, to be his witnesses. <clears throat> Jesus is preparing to go out and change the world. He's preparing to have his disciples help him accomplish this task of going out to change the world. And so you'd think that our Savior would want to call some pretty spectacular individuals. Men who were qualified, who were prepared, who were ready, who would be able to take any challenge. But that's not the picture we get of the, of the man that Jesus calls. These men were qualified, absolutely. They willingly heard their Savior's call, but were these men anything special? I think the obvious answer is no. These were just some regular guys. Regular humans who had regular jobs and had regular families and who didn't expect to be asked to change the world, but they would do exactly that. If you look at the towns these guys came from, Bethsaida, Nazareth, Cana, these are small backwater towns in the sticks in a rinky-dink little part of the world called Northern Galilee. <laughs> If you think about it, Jesus could have called much more qualified individuals to be his followers. He could have called men who were faithfully devout and studying the scriptures day and night since they were very young. Jesus could have called men who were brave enough to do anything, to stand up under any sort of resistance, who were able to do what was asked of them without fear or flinching. Yet that is not what Jesus did. No, Jesus instead decided to call fishermen. Regular guys. Jesus calls regular people. Because Jesus himself was a regular person. Think about it for a moment. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, there was nothing in his appearance to attract us to him. Jesus himself was ordinary. We always think, when we think of Jesus, we probably think of some sort of artist portraying of him, right? A man with long brown hair and a beard and a kindly face and nice, straight, and even teeth. But in all reality, Jesus couldn't, he could have been unattractive. Jesus could have had bad teeth. He could have had weirdness about him. It feels weird to think about, but really it's true. Jesus was an ordinary guy. There was nothing at looking at Jesus that you could tell this guy was special. He was ordinary. He was human. He was just like you and me, except he wasn't. He was the Lord of the universe, the God who made all things, the one who had come into the world. The pre-incarnate word was now incarnate. And Jesus called these men, as an ordinary man himself, to be his disciples. Remember, too, that Jesus had to be pointed out to his disciples. These men didn't even want to follow him initially. Think of the words that Nathaniel says about Jesus. Here, this guy is from Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Now, at best, we can say Nathaniel is thinking, oh, he, no, oh, it's actually true. Good things can come from Nazareth. But I think what we more commonly believe is this is Nathaniel being very derisive and very scornful. And here he is being challenged to come and follow this man. Nathaniel needed to see before he could believe. And how often is that the case for the world in which we live as well? about things in this world true, but more so about our Savior. Jesus has presented himself as ordinary and plain as he was. He presented himself so that the world might know who he was. Jesus has not gone to great lengths to win over this world. He has spoken and he has placed that charge on us, his church, to speak about. But Jesus has simply let the world know his truth. He doesn't use all his powers of winsomeness and charisma to gain followers. No, he simply allows the world to be, to, he reveals himself and allows the world to approach him as they are. And so what often happens as a result of our sinful natures is these people look at this man who is ordinary 
and not winsome and not charismatic, and they simply stay away. People often think of Jesus as something you can brush off, something that doesn't need to be taken seriously. People will think of Jesus as, oh yeah, you know, the, and it, it's good to know who he is. I went to church as a kid, and I learned a lot of good stuff there. I learned about Jesus, but now that I'm older, I don't really need him anymore. I know I'm saved, and that's the important part, right? Many people will look at Jesus and brush him off, not so much as this savior of the world, but as a great teacher. A man who had some really good things to say about being kind to others, and loving, and accepting as a man who wants us to be humble and not to elevate ourselves. People like that kind of Jesus. People may look at Jesus and not so much see him as a savior, but they look at his church. They look at the people who are his followers and they equate the two. They see sinful people in a church and so they think that, well, if God's people act like that, then why do I need to go to church? Why would I want to go to church? When those people are stuck up and self-righteous and they don't treat others the way, they, the way Jesus tells them to. And so people dismiss Jesus. Just like Nathaniel did. Can anything good come from this man who lived so long ago? Can anything good come from his people? But that's not us, right? I mean, you're sitting here on a Sunday morning when it's negative five out. You came here this morning to hear the words of your Savior. Thanks be to God for that. But how often do we, in our own natures, when we're not in these walls, act just like Nathaniel did? When we're sitting here in church on a Sunday morning, it's so easy to gladly hear Jesus, to sing his hymns, and to focus on what he does for us. But when we leave, it becomes that much harder to trust, doesn't it? <clears throat> It's so easy to get demoralized and, and, and have our own doubts and wonders and fears. As we look around us and see a world that continues to get worse and worse, no matter how much we tell others the good news of a Savior. We look around and we see family members who were once faithfully coming week after week completely ignore a word from their elders. As the elder begs them in a letter, please come, receive the sacrament, be welcomed at Christ's table. How often do we daily sin much and grow weak and faithless in our own lives? And we feel miserable and wonder if God could ever entrust us to be his chosen people. Though we fight it, though we hate ourselves for it, sometimes we can't help but give in and, and wonder... Why follow Jesus? Can anything good come from being one of his children? Thanks be to God that our Savior is kind in his calling. When Nathanael spoke so scornfully of his Savior, how did Jesus welcome Nathanael when Nathanael did go and see Did Jesus rebuke him for his scornful words, for his unwillingness to come in here? No, Jesus welcomed Nathanael with open arms. The first thing he says to him is, Now here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Imagine hearing that, knowing the words you had just spoken about this man, seeing his love, his gratitude, his gladness at your approach. That, my friends, is how your Savior looks at you when you come to him. Here is a Christian in whom there is nothing false. Why? Because I have declared it so. By faith, through the working of the word and sacraments, the Holy Spirit has created faith in your hearts. He has called you to be out of darkness into Jesus' wonderful light. And as a result, we know the truth. We are set free. We see the great things that our Lord has done. Just like Jesus points to himself as the, the one on whom angels ascend and descend, the link between heaven and earth, so too we see that Jesus. We are called to be his disciples. We know him as our Savior, the one who forgives our sins and who guarantees us a home in heaven. We know Jesus and we see 
his greatness. By grace, completely alone. And so, just as Nathaniel would go and see the great things that our Savior would accomplish, so too we can see these things. Think for a moment of everything that Nathaniel would get to see as a follower of Jesus. The things he could have missed if he hadn't gone and saw. He saw Jesus feeding thousands with a boy's box lunch on a mountainside. He saw Jesus patiently and gladly stride across stormy waters or speak a simple word as he was sleeping in a boat and causing a great calm to fall over the whole sea. He would see the dead raised. He would see Jesus, who he knew was dead, live and speak to him once more. Greater things than that, Nathaniel saw. And just like that, you and I see these greater things as well. We see our Savior continue to feed thousands, millions, with his holy word as he dwells with us on earth, though he has ascended in heaven. We see our Savior calm storms in our lives and stride across stormy seas and pull us out of the depths of our sin and our misery and our doubts and our fears. We see our Savior cure diseases of sin and doubt and raise us to be his new church, to be his followers, to be his chosen people. God takes ordinary people and shows them incredible things. He has done that for you, my friend. And so we don't have to fear as Jesus tells us to go and do the same. It doesn't have to be some grand story or tale or this polished, beautiful thing when we tell someone about our Savior. It can be as simple as come to church with me. There you will see. A simple invitation is sometimes all it takes to get someone to walk through these doors and to experience their Savior and to see his greatness. And so, my friends, as we walk with our Savior, as he walks toward his cross, and as we walk through our lives of faith toward our heavenly home, simply behold the greatness the Savior has put on display for you. The amazing things that he does, how he calls you out of darkness into his light. And invite others to come and see the greater things of God. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.